Welcome to the latest episode of the C64 Roundup, your concise guide to the latest news and releases for your Commodore 64. This month, we'll start off by taking a look at something cool sent into the RGN headquarters. Take a look at this fantastic looking IK Plus diorama by Pixel Memories. This is a high quality 3D printed piece of craft that does a great job in relieving some of the most treasured memories of this Commodore 64 classic. The diorama contains a simple slot mechanism that allows you to customise the display to your liking. So you can produce something like this, or this, and even something like, um, whatever this is. The slot mechanism in the diorama is sturdy, ensuring that nothing is going to fall over, even if you knock it around a bit. Pixel Design and printed in Melbourne, Australia, Pixel Memories is building up a great range of dioramas for you to choose from. Each Pixel Memories diorama incorporates numerous levels of customization and play. Some of these include multiple mounting slots for characters, interchangeable background and foreground elements, and clip-on accessories for characters. Each diorama also includes additional bonus variations, such as mirrored characters so they face in different directions, different colors, and potentially additional poses. Many of the individual character sprites can also be displayed on their own, with the included Pixel Memories display stands. Custom designs and commissions are welcomed by contacting Pixel Memories. To find out more or purchase your own dioramas, head on over to Pixel Memories eBay page. Link is in the video description. Next up is a batch of games that I tried out over the past couple of months. Sea Wolves is a competitive arcade shooter set within a submarine theme and is a tribute to the original Sea Wolf released on the C64 back in 1982. This modern day remake is astonishing in not only its visual effects but also by the number of game design elements added to it, making it a very compelling game to play. The one player mode sees you out to destroy enough black coloured vessels to fulfil your quota of 10 kills for every level. Destroying red civilian vessels will come at a cost to your quota, so you better take care with your shots. In addition, to complete a level, you must not sink more than 3 civilian ships and ensure your damage bar does not reach zero. Progressing through the levels takes you to different game environments with additional game elements being introduced along the way, such as mini subs, submarines, carriers, battle cruisers, and the Kraken. The solo mode gameplay is a lot of fun and provides an engaging and challenging experience that has had me hooked and coming back to it again and again. But what I like even more is the wingman mode, which is the same as one player mode, but adds a drone to act as your sidekick which brings a couple of different layers to the gameplay, in that all the extra missiles you shoot out make taking out cruisers and battle cruisers an easier task, but you also need to watch that you don't get carried away, because you might find yourself taking out one too many civilian vessels as well. Further, I love how you can use your drone in idle mode to shield you from homing mines. Sea Wolves also provides a two player mode to compete against with a friend, but as I have no friends I make do with pretending I have one with the game's AI mode where you go up against the computer AI where the objective is not to win a level but rather to ensure that you don't lose three levels in a row. When I first heard of Sea Wolves being in development, I was dubious that this was going to be another one to file under the play for five minutes and forget category. But coder John Woods has not only proven himself to be a highly skilled technical coder, but he has also demonstrated quality design sensibilities to make Sea Wolves much more than a nostalgic tribute and worthy of it being a quality commercial title. Sea Wolves is available as a paid digital download from Kodiak64 website. But unfortunately for my North American friends, the game is only PAL compatible. Cruisin' for a Bruisin' is a single button game where you jump from platform to platform collecting the colours to score points. The more you collect on each platform, the more points you score. The amount of colours you pick up will be multiplied with the number listed on the score bar. When you have collected all five different colours, the number will rise. If you fall to the ground, your car will explode. Picking up hitchhikers will get you 50 points. And that's pretty much it, which means that Cruisin' for a Bruising will never be anything more than a 5 minute play and forget deal. The game is available as a free digital download from itch.io. Corescape is a very challenging vertically scrolling shooter. 
Your craft is constantly moving forward and not only do you need to deal with enemies, but you also need to navigate the dangerous layout to ensure that you don't run into various structures that lay ahead of you. To have any chance in progressing through the game's 8 levels, you're going to rely on memorising the game world layout. The game does look nice and scrolling is smooth and impressive. The in-game music is really great to listen to as well, but gameplay wise, the overall pacing just threw me off somewhat, and I just struggled to maintain interest with this one. The game is designed to run on power system, but will work on NTSC machines, albeit at a faster and even more challenging speed. Corescape is available as a free digital download from itch.io. Terror by Night is a Sherlock Holmes based interactive novel. With each scene that plays out, your job is to make one of two choices. Go with your hunch or your thought. Make the right choice to progress, get it wrong, then it's game over. Graphically, the game is a mess with its stretched out and highly pixelated display. Story-wise, it is a bit of a miss, as it's very hard to follow, since the narrative feels quite disjointed. Performance-wise, Terror by Night is an improvement over previous interactive novels by a novel approach, in terms of its loading times, but you still experience a bit of delay, which just kills the experience even further. If you want to try out Terror by Night, then you can purchase a digital copy from itch.io. Huck on the Mississippi sees you take control of Huckleberry Finn as he swims home down the river on a tree trunk. Animal critters of all sorts are out to get old Huck, so you have to do your best to avoid them and you can collect fruit to score points. As you progress through the 10 levels, the animal wildlife get more aggressive with their attacks towards you. Um, well I guess from the footage you can tell it's not the most exciting of games. This would have been fine 40 years ago, but there's not much that's going to hold your attention here. Maybe a good one to get your young kids into C64 gaming. Huck is available as a free digital download. Super GP is a simple arcade style racer, inspired by games like Pit Stop and Pit Stop 2. The game contains 5 race tracks and 2 game modes, single, race and championship. Championship mode is not your typical race all track and see who ends up with the most race points type of deal. Instead you need to finish in the top 3 places in each race in order to continue. Super GP contains a car damage mechanic. Running into other cars will result in damage being sustained to your own car which then has a direct impact on your car's maximum speed. If you have taken on too much damage, you are able to pull into the pits to restore the state of your car. Super GP is by no means an easy racer to win, and things can get tense. Every position has to be earned, and you do obtain great satisfaction in doing so, as you often lose a position when you bump into other cars. Super GP is designed to run on a power system, but the game will work on NTSC, but it will run slightly faster, making the game a little harder. The game is available as a free digital download from itch.io.
News News, what is making the news? David Bottino is so passionate about the game Toki, and he was so disappointed with the original C64 conversion that he has taken upon himself 30 years later on to assemble a team that will produce an improved version of the game under the guise of Toki Remastered. By Remastered, what really is happening is that the original code is being modified to look and sound better as a lot of the original code dynamics will be retained. Having a look through the latest clip that David has released recently, there is no doubt that the remastered version is providing a marked visual improvement and I find the overall process of giving an old game a lick of new paint quite interesting. With the completion of the games Har Haragon and Goodnight, Icon 64 has returned to working on Impossible Mission 3. Looking at current clips of the game through Trevor Story's trademark wonky vision, early signs are showing that fans of the franchise are going to be pleased to see all the tropes from the first game. Impossible Mission 3 is set to contain some randomised enemy behaviour and your agent is looking like he will have access to a pistol at some point. Here is hoping we can get to play Impossible Mission 3 before Christmas this year. Adrian Marcelo Bonnet is looking to fulfil his childhood dream of producing a C64 game with his project Nikolai the Vampire. Looking to be a single screen platform game, Nikolai the Vampire is looking to contain some unique and striking art assets. The game design looks to feature your standard find the key to unlock the door mechanic at the moment, but hopefully Adrian will be able to come across a bit more inspiration to provide a gaming experience that is as unique as its graphics. Haven't done a flashback review in a little while, let's see what I can dig out from the game shelf this month. Originally released in 2016 and extended a couple of years later, the Bear Essentials is a highly engaging flip screen platformer that many viewers have experienced but has never been covered by IGN. Bear's been a bit lazy over the summer, and with winter fast approaching, Mrs. Bear has laid down the law and told Bear that he has to collect 350 apples or not bother coming home. So Bear ventures off into the wild on his quest. The Bear Essentials has such a charming look to it, with its clean interface mixed with blend of bright colours that match so well. You can't help but have the game pull you in. The game for most part is just a pure pleasure to play through. There isn't anything too groundbreaking about the Bear Essentials, but what is there is very well executed, especially with its tight controls and fair collision detection. The game contains a number of different environment worlds, most of which can be explored in any order you wish, with the deeper parts of the game requiring some thought into how to access certain areas. There is a great variety of enemies and cameo appearances of C64 game characters from old times that always provide the gamer with something new to discover. I've replayed the Bear Essentials a number of times over the recent years and have thoroughly enjoyed my time with the game right up to the point where you discover the mine section. And for me, everything grinds to a halt. You see, Coda Graham Axon is a huge fan of Manic Miner and has designed this section as a tribute to the game. And this is where my time with the Bear Essentials has always ended. I have no tolerance for Manic Miner and as a result I've never completed the Bear Essentials. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a nice idea to include a tribute to Matthew Smith's classic, but I would have altered its game mechanics to reflect the modern day sensibilities. Regardless, I still think that The Bear Essentials is one of the most quintessential single screen platformers released in the past decade for the Commodore 64. And if there's any game that will entice some of you armchair enthusiasts to pull out the old bread bin to try something new, then this is a game to do it. And that is a wrap on another edition of the C64 Roundup. Links to all the releases featured in the episode are in the video description. 
If you want to see a C64 Roundup on a more regular basis, then please take the time to sacrifice one of your likes to the algorithm gods. This will allow me to gauge just how many of you out there look forward to these roundups and perhaps make me rethink how often I should produce these episodes moving ahead. Until next time, bye for now.